Hello and welcome to the Audio Epics podcast. And the fifth episode of The Beast of the Western Wilds, A Witch Hunter Tale. Thank you for listening and going on this dark journey along with us. And we really appreciate all the feedback that we've been given, which has mostly been very positive, so thanks. By the way, uh, I myself am not much of a Twitter person, but um, if you want to tweet about uh, the story, uh, please use the hashtag BeastWW, which we've uh, set up for this particular story. For all of you who may be interested in it, um, we are going to have a release of The Beast of the Western Wilds as a download and on CD later on. And of course, that version will come as one continuous story broken up into episodes and the episodes broken up into tracks, of course. But, um, you know, without my whining in the beginning and at the end of each episode. So it, it will be one continuous dramatized audiobook. Anyway, that's all I have to say for now. So um, please just enjoy the fifth episode of The Beast of the Western Wilds. Castle Edelhard. A loud gasp from the captain shook Ludlow awake. He had no idea how long he had been sleeping. A few minutes? Or a few hours? It was still dark, but the clouds in front of the moon had parted, and now a pale light shone through the tall window, illuminating some heavy pillars and the black and white tiled marble floor. Ludlove could also see the captain's face, who was looking at him in utter, unconcealed fear. Which one to... I am here, Captain. Captain Alzenbach turned his face again, looking up to the shadowy ceiling far above. He sighed deeply. <sighs> Ludlov was still drowsy from his sudden awakening, but he felt relieved that the captain was conscious again. It was just a dream, then. Did those creatures follow you in your nightmares? Nothing like that. I wouldn't tell you this unless it was truly unusual, you know. But Love waited patiently for the man's story. I dreamed, you no, know, I saw a, a woman. She was very beautiful, completely naked, but her, her skin, it was the color of blood, and her eyes were so fiercely green and her hair was so deeply black. No living person looks like that. Ludlow frowned. He intuited that this was significant somehow. What happened in your dream? Elsenbach looked at him with an unreadable expression. I was in the woods, the Blackwoods. It was night still, but there was a pool. It was black and still. I could only see it because the moon was reflected in it. It was so real, I could smell the scent of stagnant water. I was just standing there, waiting for something. I don't know what. Then she emerged out of the water, not walking out of it, but gliding, just rising up. She looked at me, and there was amusement in her eyes. Mixed with such contempt, witch hunter, she made me feel like a bug. Then she looked me in the eye, and I felt drawn to her. But loathing her at the same time, I couldn't keep my eyes off of her, and yet she filled me with disgust. I wanted to do everything she asked of me, and yet I wanted to be as far away from her as possible. I have never felt anything like it. He sounded truly ashamed. Well, it was a dream. Ludlow was a bit nonplussed, 
but the captain shook his head, if only very slightly. No, it was not just a dream. Dreams can seem very real sometimes, but when you wake up, they're gone. That's how you know they're just dreams. Alzenbach gave Ludlow a piercing stare. That's how I know this was not just a dream. She's still here, Ludlow. I can feel it. What happened to Captain Alzenbach, the naturalist? I don't subscribe to that anymore. This woman, she was not a part of nature. Anyway, that's where the dream ended. But I fear for what might have happened if it had gone on a moment longer. Ludlove decided not to pursue the topic any longer, but he would keep this conversation in mind. Well, it's still night, but the moonlight has come through. Do you think you could stand up? We may find a more comfortable place for you to rest. It's my head that hurts, not my legs, Witch Hunter. I will come with you. But the captain had more trouble getting off the floor than either of them had anticipated. Come on. And the same held true for Ludlow, whose leg wound was still troubling him. They staggered on through a large pillared hall, at the end of which was an open doorway. Passing through it, they entered a narrow, dark corridor that eventually gave way to another room. To their right was a truly huge window, as tall as a house. It was a stained glass artwork depicting flowers and trees. The light of the moon shining through that window was just strong enough to illuminate the rest of the room. It was remarkably different from the chill, cavernous hall from whence they had come. It was part library, part sitting room. Most walls were entirely covered by enormous bookcases. To their left was a comfortable-looking area, with soft, luxurious furniture arranged around a massive marble hearth. There was charred firewood in it. You may sit there if you wish. A strange, high-pitched voice had come from the dark. Ludlow's heart skipped a beat as he looked up. There, straight ahead of him, stood a figure as pale as the moon. At first, he couldn't quite make out its features, but then the figure stepped forth and revealed itself. It was no monster, despite the pallor. It was a young man, probably in his late twenties, but there was something off-kilter about his entire appearance. His clothes, while clearly expensive, were decades out of fashion, and they didn't fit his unusually thin frame. And despite his young age, there was a sense of fatigue emanating from him, from his slouching posture to the dark-rimmed eyes that lay sunken deep in his narrow face. His sandy hair was thin and short-cropped. Oh, we... We apologize for our intrusion. The captain kept quiet, merely observing the young man with a barely concealed expression of discomfort and revulsion. Their strange host offered them a weak little smile, but it came across as genuinely polite. You are surprised to find the castle inhabited. That is quite understandable. Do not fear. No one will kill you here. Well, that's a relief. The captain hobbled to a satin-cushioned divan and laid himself down with a great sigh. My friend is wounded. He needs a place to rest. The young man cast a gaze at Ludlow's leg. You seem to be hurt as well. It's not so bad. Still, please sit. My master will be with you shortly. With those words, the young man turned and left the room. Ludlow found a comfortable leather chair and sat down. <clears throat> he looked at Captain Alzenbach, who was nursing his head. They could only hope there would be no lasting damage. It was quiet again, except for the fluttering of Fulcrin's wings as he explored the environment. Then Ludlov heard footsteps behind him, and the soft light of a flame suddenly entered the room, bringing life to it. He turned and saw a stately man of indiscernible age holding a candelabra with five candles. Ludlow started to rise, but the gentleman gestured for him to remain seated with his free hand. He cut quite a remarkable figure. 
His black slashed obsidian studded doublet and shoulder cape were still very stylish wear, if a bit overly dramatic, but the ostentatious ruff around his neck would have made him stand out like a sore thumb in any polite company of the current decade. His face was noble in bearing, but harsh and distant, an effect only amplified by the lavish moustache and meticulously trimmed pointed beard he sported. The man's expression was inscrutable as he passed Ludlow and set the candelabra on the mantelpiece. He then turned to the witch hunter and addressed him. I suppose I have no other choice but to welcome you. Please don't feel obliged. I know my friend and I were not exactly invited. The strange man stroked his beard, and in that moment, Ludlow suddenly realized this gentleman looked familiar to him somehow. Yes, well, I did intend to have you killed at first, but you proved to be made of sterner stuff than I expected. I suppose you've earned the right to live, at least for now. His dark eyes were dull and narrow as he scrutinized his two guests. So, are you the one who sent the creatures who attacked us? They do my bidding. You sent those creatures? Then you must have sent the ones that kidnapped my grandson also. Their host smiled. Little Frederick is here. The captain emerged out of the divan. Where is he? Bring him here. Ludlow also got up to support the captain before he fell down. The strange man looked at them, mildly amused. The boy is sleeping in a satin-cushioned bed upstairs. Hans will take you to see him if you want. Hans! A pale young man who had greeted them earlier appeared almost immediately. He had to have been standing right outside of the room, Ludlow noted. Sir? Take Captain Elsenbach here to see Frederick. He needs to know I speak the truth, and try not to wake the baby. He needs his sleep. Yes, of course. Hans walked over to the divan where the captain was once again seated. The young man helped him up and supported him. You stay here, witch hunter. While Ludlow had no idea what to make of this character in front of him, he concluded it would be wisest to obey him for now. As Hans and the captain left the room, Ludlow saw the man take out a pipe and light it. The casual air of authority with which he conducted himself told the witch hunter beyond any doubt that this was a nobleman. The cold eyes, the whiskers, the nobility. He knew who this was. So, you know us. I know you are a witch hunter from Seven Peaks, but your name escapes me for the moment. Ludlow, you seem to be familiar with Captain Elsenbach as well. The man blew smoke, filling the air with a thick scent of burnt pipeweed. Of course I am. He's a local. I know all about them, even though they have forgotten about me. Well, the mayor still keeps your portrait in his office, for now. He has been thinking about getting rid of it, though, my lord. A slight smile raised the corners of the nobleman's mouth for a moment. I suppose I don't need to introduce myself, then. How could I not recognize Count Rufus of Edelhart, who once ruled throughout these parts? Very well, Ludlow the Witch Hunter. Now that we know each other, let's talk. The Count sat down on the divan where Elsenbach had been seated before. I suppose you and the Captain came here to retrieve the baby. Naturally. And understandably, unfortunately, though... I cannot allow it. Well, the vicious attack of your little minions made that clear enough. The Count eyed the witch hunter lazily. I suppose you want me to apologize for that? Not particularly. I do not expect such a thing from a man who will not even offer his guests a drink. Adelhart grinned. If I had offered you a drink, you would have refused it. Ludlow had to admit that was true. Politeness aside, why did you abduct little Frederick and why are you so adamant on keeping him here? You may not believe me, Witch Hunter, but really all I want is that no harm comes to the boy. If I wanted him dead, don't you think my minions would have simply killed him instead of bringing him here? That doesn't really answer my question, my lord. <laughs> I will inform you and your friend together when he returns. In the meantime, I want to learn about you, Witch Hunter. Lord Love reclined in his chair, hmm. taking in Count Edelhard's features. The man was naturally charismatic. No one could deny that. His voice and composure exuded class and refinement, and yet there was a harsh and blunt quality to him. Ludlow expected him to go straight for his own carefully considered girls at every turn. Either he was eminently practical-minded, or he was a callous egomaniac. 
the witch hunter would be on his guard while conversing with the Count. I am not particularly interesting, my lord. I am merely here to assist the good people of Schnettwald and make their village whole again, insofar as that is still possible. Edelhard pointed the stem of his pipe at Ludlow. But you are a witch hunter, and because of that, I think you will find my story quite interesting. I would indeed be very happy to learn more about you, my lord. Ludlow deftly turned the topic of the conversation away from himself. For example, why are you still alive? And you don't even look particularly wrinkled. Shouldn't you be well over a hundred years old? One hundred and seventy-six, to be precise. Footsteps. The Count turned to the doorway as Hans and the Captain entered. Ludlow looked at his companion questioningly. He spoke the truth. Frederick is here, and he's safe. Count Edelhardt rose from his seat. Please, Captain, feel free to rest in my divan. You need to recover. Elsenbach silently agreed to that, and slowly made his way back to his seat, all the while supported by the pale young man. All the fury seemed to have been drained from the captain. Perhaps he was simply relieved to know that his grandson was alive and well, or perhaps his strength was failing him. In either case, for the time being, it was probably best to avoid antagonizing the Count too much. Count Edelhardt was just telling me about himself. As the captain was sitting down, he suddenly paused for a moment. Count Edelhardt? Then he couldn't think of anything more to say. Yes, I'm still alive. The nobleman stood smoking his pipe by the hearth. Meanwhile, Hans was kneeling in front of it, kindling the firewood. Elsenbach reclined with a sigh, putting up his feet. This night is becoming stranger by the minute. I thought you had died or left or disappeared over a hundred years ago. As the fire in the hearth was lit, the room was bathed in a warm light, making it a surprisingly pleasant environment, despite the surrounding gloom. The finely woven Parslevanian rug and the heavy curtains were now alive with warm color. Thank you, Hans. The young man stood up and bowed. Then Hans quietly left the three men alone. To answer your question, Captain, my wife and I did indeed depart from the public sphere around that time, but as you can see, I'm not dead. A somber look came over Count Edelhard's face. Since having you killed proved unsuccessful, I will explain myself, and perhaps then you will understand why Frederick cannot leave this place. Ludlow saw a defiant look in Captain Elsenbach's eyes, but the man was wise enough to restrain himself. I would be very interested in that story. My wife and I married young. We were both 19 years old. I was the heir to the Edelhardt bloodline, and she was a baroness from up north. Although our marriage was an arranged one, we found ourselves quite attracted to each other, as we had many things in common. Some will say we were too preoccupied with each other, and not enough with the needs of the people. But we were living in a time when the rise of the country guilds was beginning to reduce our function as nobility to a mere ceremonial one. Ingelil and I did not mind. We were never very interested in worldly affairs, but rather what appealed to us was knowledge of the spirit realm. And so we sought it in any way possible. If you raise your eyebrows at this point, Witch Hunter, I strongly suspect that the rest of the story will fill you with loathing. Ingelil and I were both fairly open-minded about our wedding vows, and when we learned about the work of the ancient philosopher Iliandin, we weren't squeamish about putting his theory to practice. You see, Leandin wrote that there is a pathway for the living soul to touch the higher realm of existence through experiencing extreme physical pleasure. As you can imagine, we were quite keen on trying it out. It started out as quite a lovely enhancement to our relationship, despite the unwelcome fruit that our passion would bear from time to time which we could easily end using the right herbs and concoctions. Still, little happened in the way of spiritual awakening, so we started to take it a little bit further, inviting others to our bed and eventually introducing pain as a catalyst. You see, we came to the conclusion that pain helps a great deal to make the pleasure of following it more intense. From that moment on, things started changing. Once in a while, one of us would 
have a dream or an, an epiphany of sorts, but it was always something very brief and just beyond our grasp. Our quest turned into an obsession, and over time our senses grew dulled to the throes of passion, and pain itself became the pleasure we were seeking. We went as far as we could to the very edges of what a mortal can bear, and so, after months of what you would probably call debauchery, we did indeed manage to contact the other realm, and what we found overwhelmed us. You must know that the world around us is full of spirits of every kind. Some are more open to visitors than others, and some are actively hostile. We were contacted ourselves by one who was, shall we say, extremely friendly. She gave us a window into a world beyond this one. There was knowledge there and bliss and harmony. She gave us experiences you couldn't even imagine. Our quest had made us quite indifferent to the world. While we were put in charge of this entire county, we didn't even tend to the castle. Servants would leave or die without being replaced. We simply didn't care, for our minds were in the spirit world. Then, one day, we received a visit from Ingle's parents, who had caught wind of the goings-on at Edelhart Castle. I'm afraid they found us in a drug-induced stupor, a rather unflattering situation at the best of times. I will never forget their fury. They said we were already living in a decade of scepticism and distrust towards the aristocracy, and here we were confirming every prejudice the ordinary man held towards our kind. In my heart I knew we had been careless, but I was young and proud, and I defied them, and so did Ingelil. As a result, the Baron and Baroness decided to take Ingelil back with them, forcibly, to North Evenendale. There was little I could do. I had absolutely no power over them, and so I let them take her, hoping that she would return one day. One year later, Ingelil suddenly came back. She was all alone. Her parents had died in a fire. I knew in my gut she had started it, and she later confessed it to me. From the moment she had crossed that line and I had silently agreed to it, it became so seductively easy to dispose of anyone who threatened us, or judged our way of life. Free from the burden of disapproval, we practiced rituals, sacrificing animals at first, then servants, then visitors. We wasted all of our fortune and we didn't care. Eventually we were left with just the two of us as the castle fell into disrepair. We hardly noticed, so enraptured were we by what the spirit was giving us. That's when the rumors of our death started circulating, and the name of the Black Woods was first mentioned, although the area had not yet become as corrupted as it is now. Ludlove and Captain Alsenbach had been listening quietly, unable to hide their shock and disgust at the horrible tale. Now silence fell, as the Count set aside his pipe on the mantelpiece to let the tobacco cool. I'll have that drink now, my lord. He had never heard a man speak so candidly about his own sordid behavior. The Count didn't exactly sound proud of his past, but neither did it seem to bother him very much. He was a man who had been making excuses for so long that he had permanently silenced the voice of his conscience. Count Adelhart made a subtle gesture. Ludlove heard footsteps behind him. Hans will fetch you both a good strong drink. Don't worry, it's not poisonous in any way. By now you will see, probably, that I am, if anything, an honest man. Captain Alsenbach addressed the Count. Count, uh... I have a question. Oh, I do not doubt that you will have many when I am finished. Can it wait? No, I really need to know now. Hans arrived with two round glasses, apparently containing some sort of strong liquor. Very well then, ask. Elsenbach accepted the glass and stuck his nose in it. Here you go. Furwood brandy. Can't be all bad. Then he raised his head and looked the Count in the eye. This spirit, you called her she. So I assume you saw a woman. Can you describe her? Ludlow accepted the glass of brandy from Hans Thank you. and listened for the Count's answer. So, she has visited you, has she? There was a mysterious smirk on the Count's face. 
Elsenbach did not reply. If what you saw might have been a dream, but it was too present to be a dream, you might have seen her. If it was a woman who filled you with desire and made you want to break every vow you ever made just to be with her, you might have seen her. And if she also made you feel tainted and filthy just for being in her vicinity, you probably did see her. Does that answer your question? The captain nodded, a little shaken. I'm not surprised that she has already started to seek you out. She will want you. You are fresh meat, a new challenge. Rudlov quietly wondered why he had had no such experiences so far. She sounded like a spirit out to consume souls. Surely the soul of a witch hunter would appeal to her. She was a demon in league with Lucas, the great evil, and by the time Ingel and I were alone with her in the castle, we knew that she had dazzled us and had slowly taken away everything we had in the real world. So we kept on wallowing in the visions of ecstasy that she was still giving us. It was then that the corruption of the woods truly began. The Count fell quiet for a bit, as he stared at some unseen point in the distance. And then she died. Ingelil. It was all very sudden. She had had too much absinthe, I think, or it might have been something else. Her body had reacted badly, and just like that, the light of my life was extinguished. You wouldn't understand. Ludlov knew exactly what the Count meant, but he refused to speak. So did Captain Elsenbach, who was also a widower. Meanwhile, the nobleman was too caught up in his own story to notice either of the two men. I almost died of grief mourning her, but eventually I consoled myself with the hope of an afterlife. But hope was not enough. I needed certainty, and so I contacted the spirit again. I wish I hadn't done that. I figured out one thing about her. This spirit, she doesn't lie. She'll manipulate you. She'll omit important parts of the truth and deliberately withhold what she doesn't want you to know, but for whatever reason, she will not lie straight to your face. Nevertheless, she will use the truth in the worst possible way. The Count bit his lips and furrowed his brow, trying to compose himself. I believe that she told me the truth when I asked her. She said Ingelil's soul belonged to her now, and that she was in her domain. I was not satisfied with that. I wanted to see... And so she showed me. The callous nobleman was gone now. All Ludlove could see was a man wrecked by grief. I saw my wife. She was somewhere dark and colorless. It was a very narrow chasm, just wide enough to fit a person crawling through. I saw her there, in between those two rough walls of rock, and she was trying to grasp some of the outcroppings to climb upwards. But every time she made an attempt to crawl up, Bits of rock crumbled underneath her feet and hands, and she slid a little bit further down. And so it continued, slowly but surely, continuing her way down into the dark, forever. There was no hunger, no thirst, no other people, just the rocks, the darkness, and the depths. And I knew that she would continue on like this with no end. There was no hard stone awaiting her down there, no cold river, nor even a field of rusty spikes. There was nothing but an endless sliding away into oblivion, further and further away from any light, any company, any hope. With every inch that she fell, she was further removed from everything and everyone, more and more forgotten. This is where she is now, and I know it will not change, not in ten years, not in a hundred. Not when all the world is unrecognizably changed and our age has passed into myth and legend. Even after the skies have fallen and the whole world will be destroyed, she will still be sliding down into that same darkness. I knew these things the very moment I saw them and I knew there was nothing that I could possibly do to help her, or even to contact her. A deep silence fell. Ludlov had forgotten all about his drink. He actually pitied the man who had kidnapped Frederick and tried to have the captain and himself killed. For nothing the Count could do to the both of them 
would even compare to what he had just described. I'm sure you'll understand. I was overcome by fear because I knew my soul belonged to this demon as well. I had known that for a long time, but I suppose some naive part of me hoped that at least in death, Ingalil and I would be joined, even if it was in the underworld that she had prepared for us. I thought that being together for all eternity would be worth any sacrifice. But she... She rewards only with eternally growing loneliness. Of course she does. She's a demon. There is no hope or comfort in their realms. I know that now. Therefore I will do anything, anything to avoid the fate that befell my wife. And I told the demon as much. I begged her if there was any way I might be saved from those depths. She smiled at me, and with such cold glee it made my blood freeze. He took his pipe from the mantelpiece and started cleaning it. Then she devised what she called a game. The rules were strange but simple. As long as a male descendant of my bloodline lived, I could still remain here in this castle undying and thus be safe from her underworld. But it wouldn't be a game if there was nothing at stake, she said. And so she would be unleashing a beast from the underworld and she would set it loose on my bloodline. And if that beast ever managed to find and kill the last male in my bloodline, the barriers around Castle Edelhart would be lifted, and I would be taken to eternal damnation. Captain Alzenbach glowered at the Count. Wait, is that why you abducted Frederick? Count Edelhart simply stared at the Captain. I'm not in the habit of abducting babies for the fun of it, Captain, whatever you may think of me. I sent the Snatchers, my minions, to take Frederick away from you only to keep him safe from the beast. But he's not of your bloodline. Is he? Did you really think that the extensive adulterous fornication that my wife and I engaged in would remain without consequences? There were girls involved from the farmlands to the east and the north of here. At the time, we didn't care about the results of our intimacy. Perhaps part of this game of the demons was simply to punish me for my disregard of any children I might have sired. Ludlow shook his head at that. While demons were known to punish their victims, they did not do so for the sake of justice but only for their own cruel pleasure, priding themselves in playing a part reserved for the goddess. I began a frantic search for my offspring. For many decades I sent out my snatches to be my eyes and ears, learning about what happened. I got to know everything about this area. It turned out I did have a son, who had a son, who had a son. I watched my lineage from afar as I settled in my lonely existence. For over a century there was not a sign of the beast, but I remained vigilant. By now I had learned that demons were patient. Rather than sinking into complacency, I became more anxious and worried as time went on. I knew at some point the beast would come. And then at once, some thirty years ago, it did. It appeared in the midst of winter, and in a few nights three of my descendants were dead. There was one left. Or so I thought. One of the men of my bloodline who fell victim to the beast had been a travelling mercenary. He had known many women in his life, including one from Schnertwald. She had a son, and I assumed the mercenary was the father, and so I had the boy abducted and brought to my castle, where I raised him as my own. You mean Hans? Yes. In time I learned Hans' father was another man, and therefore that we were not related, but I had come to love the boy as a son. I have since learned that his mother became an outcast in the village, living near the edges, excluded from daily life. Heidi? Heidi Winkler is Hans's mother? Count Edelhard simply nodded. In any case, all remained quiet for three decades until very recently. The beast appeared and struck again. This time it killed a man from one of the farms further east. Shortly after his son, a peddler, was killed as well. Despite all my efforts, it turned out I had missed something in the tracing of the branches of my family tree. There was another line of descendants. The farmer's son was Casper, wasn't he? My son-in-law. The arrogant features of the Count actually turned sympathetic. Yes, Frederick's father, your daughter's late husband, was the son of that farmer and a descendant of my bloodline. Captain Alzenbach couldn't quite hide his revulsion at that. We don't choose our origins, do we? Lord Edelhart, why do you think this demon gave you this opportunity to remain living? Edelhart held his hands behind his back, cocking his head, 
As far as I can tell, she enjoys the game of it. But I sense you have your own expert opinion. Enlighten me, witch hunter. Ludlov gave the nobleman a piercing stare. Demons are predators of souls. And they are patient. And like many predators in the wild, they enjoy playing with their prey, wearying it out, and striking when the time is just right for the perfect kill. The Count straightened, trying to appear unfazed by Ludlow's words, but the fear in his eyes was unmistakable. You mean to say that she will eventually ensnare me in her underworld, and I will be falling into darkness for all eternity just like my wife? Well, I can promise you, Witch Hunter, I will not let that happen. Ludlove had a sip from his brandy. Tell me, Lord, do you think you are smarter than a demon? Oh, I'm not that presumptuous. You must understand, my Lord, that demons were once angels. They are beings of pure spirit, much closer to the goddess than mortal man. Lucus was once an angel, and he managed to slay the maiden and almost eradicated mankind, and there are rumors that he will return. What you are dealing with here is a being more powerful and terrible than any monster or wizard, for all they can do is destroy the body, but she can destroy the soul. This little Spiritual quest of yours has opened the door to that and unleashed it. Not just on you and your wife, but on the good people of this county. How can you possibly know what can or cannot happen? You don't have the power to allow or disallow anything when it comes to this demon. It's that simple, my lord. The Count did not look offended or even fearful. It was like Ludlov's words had simply bounced off of him. You mean to say that my soul is lost? Ludlov rose out of his chair and started pacing around the room. I suggest you take it up with the goddess, my lord. Your own cleverness will never do, no matter how much of it you may have. And making deals with demons never ends well. The witch hunter grasped the back of Captain Elzenbach's divan. So... This enchantment, does it protect the castle, or does it protect you? Both. Everyone in this castle is safe from all death and injury. So that's why you don't look all that old? I suppose so. Although Hans was a baby when he arrived here, and he is a grown man now. I'm glad I took it upon myself to raise him. Took it upon yourself? There is a grief-stricken mother in Schnatwald who has thrown away the last three decades of her life wallowing in misery because she believed her son to be dead. Do not talk as if you have done anything noble here, my lord. Count Edelhart moved closer to Ludlow and looked him in the eye. I assure you, witch hunter, I may be of noble blood, but there is not a noble bone in my body. According to your set of principles, I'm probably as wicked as they come. But I love Hans. If I am indeed to fall into that unspeakable abyss... In Hans, at least, I will have left behind a worthy legacy. Thank you, father. The witch hunter turned to face the young man. Hans, is it true what Lord Edelhart is saying? It is true, Master Lulov. He has been very kind to me, and I can confirm his kindness towards Frederick as well. Be that as it may, Frederick belongs with Nicky. I understand your sentiment, Captain, but you must know that Frederick is here only for the sake of his own safety. As long as he remains in my castle, he cannot be taken by the beast. Here he will not die. Elzenbach looked unimpressed. <laughs> All you care about is staying out of the underworld. Frederick does not mean anything to you. Do you really plan on keeping him here forever? To avoid the eternity that this demon has prepared for me? Yes, I do. I am willing to raise him and stay with him here until all the seas rise up and flood the earth, if that is what is needed. The beast is smart. I know it killed the miller who was Casper's father. It might even have killed Casper himself. Casper died in our home. He was ill. You speak nonsense, Count. Don't be so presumptuous. 
This beast may have had some kind of poison in its body that led to the illness. Or perhaps his death was simply a coincidence. In either case, the beast knows its next victim. Your grandson. The captain shifted uncomfortably in his seat. You were stuck here in your castle. How do you even know when this beast is out and about? The Count smiled proudly for a moment, then gave Elsenbach a flat stare. I told you, I have eyes and ears everywhere, Captain. Your minions. Indeed. And as I said, they're called Snatchers. They are part of the Edelhart legacy, let's just say that, shall we? Lovely legacy. Captain Elsenbach caressed his head wound. Yes, well, I suppose I should apologize for trying to have you killed. I am... sorry. And since it's getting so late, it's early. I suppose I can make up for your earlier confrontation with my Snatchers by giving you a place to rest for tonight. You will have a comfortable room at your disposal, and you will be able to be close to your grandson, Captain, in the full knowledge that he is in no danger. Captain Elsenbach sighed. I don't have much of a choice, do I? You do not. Even if you were to leave without Frederick and the Beast decided to leave you alone, you are in no condition to make the journey back through the Black Woods. If you don't mind, Lord Adelhard, I would prefer to remain here in the library for the night. Are you certain? I have plenty of comfortable rooms available. I am certain. I think I will stay awake and do some reading. The Count shook his head in disbelief. <sighs> you still don't trust me? I have no interest in harming either of you anymore now that you are here, Witch Hunter. In fact, it wouldn't be possible. There is no death in this castle. That is how it's enchanted. Ludlove sat down in the same chair again. I will remind you that it was a demon who put that enchantment upon this place. Do not think there is anything life-giving about it either, my lord. Whatever I may think of you, it is her influence over this building that has me worried most of all. Captain Elsenbach needs his rest, but at least one of us should stand guard. As you wish then, Witch Hunter. Then the Count took the candelabra from the mantelpiece. Hands, help Captain Elsenbach. Let's find him a room. As the Count left the room, Hans helped the Captain out of his divan. When Captain Elsenbach spoke, Hans halted for a moment. I know we can't stay here, Witch Hunter, but this night... It's been too long. I can't go on right now. Ludlow shook his head. You are wounded and tired, and now is not the time to go traveling through the woods again. It is good that you rest. Be close to your grandson. Tomorrow is another day, and we will see what we can do then. Then, the two men left, and Ludlow was alone with the fire.